Hi. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Welcome to DIA. Um, I'm Jasmine Raymond, the curator at DIA. And um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the readings in contemporary poetry, um, which I am glad that our dear friend and poet, Vincent Katz, joined me um, in this endeavor. It started back in 2011 when we went for casual lunch and talked about how we wanted to restart the series. Um, there has been a small hiatus when, when Dia moved most of his program up to Dia Beacon and um, closed Dia Chelsea across the street. So mm -hmm. we conceived another um, situation here to reinitiate the poetry readings because we were missing it. Um, in this space on Monday nights also we have another series called the Artist, Artist on Artist lecture series and we thought it was important to come back also with poetry. Um, I would like to extend a warm thank you to Amalia Dayan and Adam Lindemann, Barbara and Charles Wright, and an anonymous donor for their generous support of this program. The series is also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Culture Affairs. And last, we, all, we also would like to extend our thanks to Brooklyn Brewery for the complimentary beverage. And to my friends and colleagues um, at DIA for all their help behind the scenes. And most important to the poets tonight, Laura Morite, Moritari and Kimberly Lyons for accepting this invitation. Um, I also want to make a, a mention because it's the beginning of the season. This is the first program in, that we do in 2011. 2011 is an anniversary year for us. Um, first, we're celebrating 30 years of being in Bridgehampton at the Dan Flavin Art Institute. Yay! And we're also celebrating in May, we start our birthday at Dia Beacon, um, 10th years. Um, so that's a lot of years <laughs> and um, when you add them up. And I hope that you all get a chance to go in either direction. Bridgehampton, we just opened a small show of Chamberlain's work. Um, there and also dance work is on permanent display and up in Beacon um, For those of you who haven't been in a while Take a look. We're reinstalling some galleries and we're celebrating our collection. So no more delay It is my pleasure to introduce Vincent who will provide the introductions to the poets. Thank you Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you all for coming on this Monday. It's our first try at a Monday, and it seems like it's going pretty well so far. So far, so good. I think it's just going to get better. Uh, so Kim, I'm going to call her Kim, I think, instead of Kimberly, although Kimberly is her official name. We'll read first, followed by Laura. We'll have a short break in between. Kimberly Lyons was born in 1958 in Tucson, Arizona. She lived in Pennsylvania, California, and Minnesota before moving with her family to Chicago. She attended Chicago's Columbia College and in 1981 graduated from Bard College, where she studied with Robert Kelly and Toni Morrison. Lyons took workshops with John Yao at the Poetry Project, where she also taught and was program coordinator She's the publisher of the poetry press Lunar Chandelier, which has published books by Veet Bakaitis, Joe Elliott, John Godfrey, Tony Simon, and Lynn Barrett since it started in 2010. Lyons is the author of several books of poetry, including Abracadabra, Saline, Phototherapeak, and both published in 2012, Rouge, from Instance Press and the Practice of Residue from Subpress. Her broadside asterisk 12 was published by Fewer and Further Press also in 2012. Lyons has published criticism, including an essay on the work of Bernadette Mayer in a recent issue of the journal Aufgabe. The epigraph to Kim Lyons' book Abracadabra reads, quote, accumulation, love, degeneration, and regenerated dives. It is a quote from the poetry of Joseph Travelo and could serve as a standard for much of Lyon's impressive achievement as a poet. Her lines accumulate rather than bind together via standard syntax. 
yet they shy away from parataxism as well. There's something in her adopted New York roots that keeps the flow of a day going and coming into her poems in unexpected ways and places. She updates Shakespeare in a way only a suave denizen of urban poetry could. Where is this place, she asks, and answers herself. But that's a sucker's question. I mean, really, is it better to improve and improve at a defined game or to fuck up in continuous instances in a situation only possibly a game? From her poem, She Es Saada. Her process yields unpredictability. Her music is mellifluous. Wit reigns over all. Avoiding the pratfall often encountered in verse this wide ranging, which is to resort to a laugh effect. Even quote, an ugly pink and gray Montefiore hospital mug, quote, in her poems, retains seriousness, its facticity, especially as a receptacle here for perfect coffee. Daily excursions in word, by foot, and the familial too are part and parcel. But love goes beyond, even to the overview and view of detail. Lyons' rhetoric holds it all together. In her book, Rouge, Lyons creates a register of days passing, speed, and the inability to freeze an image or sometimes even locate one. Quote, between this afternoon and tonight, a pale blank book that washes out the world's ink so that the message, so to speak, is a kind of soap from her poem, Wash Out. Kim Lyons will take us on a rapid ride through cities we never knew. Please welcome her to Dia. Hi, friends and others. Thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> of course, it's an absolute thrill to read it at Dia, um, which I remember the very early readings with the sweating Jimmy Schuyler, with Michael Palmer, a very tense, edgy reading, and with Alice Notley with her beautiful little book. Um, and I don't think in those days I ever would have thought I'd be reading here. And, um, but it was wonderful to be here just um, like two months ago, a month ago, when uh, Julian Berlaski <laughs> sang cowboy songs for us. So there's a wide arc. And how great to read with Laura Moriarty, who said to me um, at the bar, we had a little gathering beforehand, and she said something like, I don't know so many people in New York. And I wonder if Laura knows what a swath her work um, has cut and what an impact her work um, had on many of us when it were, first hit the scene. It seemed like she was putting things together that nobody else had done. From Rouge. Thank you, Vincent. Sonnet number two. When leaves staineth, it's like this morning, which is foggy, introverted, over Brooklyn. As I creep out for coffee, sit in this empty cafe staring at a cement wall. The surrounding hum of air conditioners condenses thought to a gray stream in which a few sparkles hide. I wonder why I dreamed last night of swimming in long grass fields, came to an edge of a Venetian lagoon, and then swam with monstrous snapping eels, as though the instance of panic warns of menace, or maybe it's the inner part of myself, a sort of joke, that brings this information from one sector to another, that I contain the monstrous eels, and it's my own thoughts that staineth. Drain. It is good to feel every motion as a dry series of codes, to be a flag for nothingness in a purple jacket with black socks that keep falling down, and an arm that lifts, falls, brings to, and puts back. Good to walk in leaves, trashed coffee cups, and shit. Good to be down there. See between the wet grid of the drain a whirlpool of water and grit circling a provisional position in its universe. Good to carry a cell of multicolored substance, chloroplasts, and mitochondria string. To apply for surcease from something invisible, as though a picture forms at its own discretion in the so-called mind, a nebula of impulses 
that holds between neural pincers a cloudy, dissimulated, polarized brush of gestures. And that is good, and our motions are the generator of traces in the wake of a body that collect like wet lace, like leaves do, caught as they are between the bars. You know, I was thinking when I um, was putting my read this reading together, back in the days when I was working at the Poetry Project, and I had, um, I felt very irritated when poets would have their little pile of books just all marked, and it seemed so smug and organized. It's like, let me see the raw pages, you know. And here I am doing the exact same thing. I have, I have, don't worry, I have a few raw pages here. Emily Dickinson's house. With a finger across the mouth, she forbade us to go upstairs. A slap that tingles like 19th century Massachusetts cold. Aromatic as pines across a bedroom window, which I try and stare into like an x-ray. Crossed with refractory shadows, bound as a book, it resists penetrations or speculations. I feel like an old blackish skeleton from a derogotype a man in a brown suit who pauses in the midst of obligations to assess an enigma, feel an apprehension as though I were the worm crawling through the apple you let fall to the ground. Rouge. Silver somehow is rink and dink. Near the moon, I saw crimson, yellow, and fog, a white at the inner of green, an apple gone wet, a cassius blue of the upper atmosphere, nears the universal black. The skin of an olive is thick as my grandmother's raggedy sealskin jacket. A black sweater's sparkling buttons at night, efflorescent like the sea. What color is a mouth, an underside of blue, in the 50s called hydrangea? But lips may be the color of almonds or hazelnut, and blue in blue threads, persistent enough to be red. Scraffito scra scrapes wax from color, night from day, with a thin finger at dawn, until the color of the rain, which everyone knows but is unknown, saturates a room. And colors emerge tiredly, and a scarf is too orange, rouge, and blatant this morning, separates from its body in the way a wave carries a glassy echo away from the deep, or wool shreds from the bulk, or you find a hair in a book. Its colorless string haunts. A teal coat seen from the window is inhuman without the body and the red brick of a building with white clay lines is terribly sad. On Picasso's birthday, the night before was elastic and hidden, a streak of pale stems barely legible, a cyanotype that flowers peculiarly over a duration of 30 years, as though developed in a white, intangible water made out of sperm and saline and linseed oil, which obscure the light while using its remnants. The choir sings happy birthday, Pablo, in Latin, Disguised, some nights can be discerned from a transparency that intensifies into readability and floats on the surface. You don't go to sleep on your birthday. You wake up from the dead. The night is over and the wet leaves all fall down. Wash out. Between this afternoon and tonight, a pale blank book that washes out the words ink, 
so that the message, so to speak, is a kind of soap and resides in mounds of a material and is tangential to a set of white, tangential to a set of dirty white roofs and areas of standing cold water bisected by vaporous trails and blackbirds. One crow alighted on the rail like a fleshy monster decorated with creamy scallops that twirl into spiraled space. A glowing pyramid set bizarrely on a roof for what? Could one's writing hand be the invisibility inside the crumpled black glove? The collapse of a linkage that amplifies the reason for the insularity? Because the raw skin looks pricked with holes when you study it, and I guess that you need to cohere, and I guess that you need that to cohere, though a connection to another is as shredded with the string that holds gloves to a coat. The umbilicus between forms at 2.30 p.m. is the meat of the embryo substance, sustenance. At 2.30 p.m. is the meat of the embryo's sustenance, as is a body of text, as they say, to its mother, the dictionary providing definitions and taking them away in one weak, long, withheld breath. What's early? On any Wednesday now, the dark comes early. Though who's to say anymore what's early? Anything green that remains. Lurid as gasoline, a lit Christmas bulb's curved, broken horizon. Apparently, each day of the week is a projected shine, inked plate, and letter-pressed page, a muddy book found on the ground by a foraging foot that kicks open the day's dictionary in which outrance, dice, and divine of the sky are found. Words like black passages, each a tight ball, you stand in a dream and try to call until Wednesday flies over, it's morning now. Something cranks, yields, our albino corn experiment has grown. Outside, surprise, it's nearly white today, and early is late in relation to the utter, lost, last, moonlit, lavender ray. So mention is made in this poem of finding a book on the ground by a foot that kicks open the day's dictionary. That dictionary was uh, a, um, a dictionary of, of Kannada to English, English to Kannada, Kannada being an Indian dialect, K-A-N-N-A-D-A. And from that found book, this book, The Practice of Residue, the poem, The Practice of Residue, was, was found in that dictionary on Christmas Eve on the sidewalk in Park Slope, Brooklyn, using a technique that all the poets here know, dowsing into a, a desperately dowsing into a text, and look what comes out. So this is from The Practice of Residue. Full of love, coagulate, electricity, eager to learn, magical practices, a state of strangeness. The true skin, a hurricane, circular inky liquid that makes the wood pigeons a bag of silk, a cymar which cuts water, the blue carbon that cuts the Gordian knot, the one-eyed one who makes a dog-headed man. Linger, lover, every day. The deliciousness of a moist Russian narcissus strike gently, sending letters by post, Diffused, be loosely suspended, of infallible metrical foot. Mark with holes, a beloved day book. Keep on darting, agitating the light of day, inside forever brilliant absence, mend a soaked morning star. Pour off ornamental sediment, leave behind a bone, crack by heat a code, removing colors, the distance of the star, the true north decoction, to translate what is unintelligible, the last names falling off. Inscribe the void, clear flowing down leaves, subtract, deflect the course of purification, utter the spirit of erasing delirious letters, passage that can be poisonous. Extirpation of the artificial description of water, accumulated matter, to take away from water the separate part, a tooth the nude unraveling terms, meaning. The rails of a waterless traveler's region descends into ancestors, medicine tending to a state of being, commission of derived lineage, the undressed diffluent, 
the, the room's slow position ripples in water, a process, the delay. Two vowels having two petals dip into a short bath by refraction. The diola, a two-handled vase, the circuit of the throat. In describing a curve, wet, windy strip of hope, expel refusal to believe, produces self-control, leave off, deduct from, the stained disorder. Spread hair in integral cohesion, slight pulverizing out of a grave, cloak the act. Who dispenses medicines at a distance, dilated by pressure from within? Divert mental pain, spirit distillation is drawn into drops. Want of union or the quiet of worry, unclothed by which another in a giddy forecast, descent into divination, double reading under the garb, make deep inquiry. Working by degrees through what is drained off, array, convert, adorn in linen, rough documents further down the stream. And here's a selection of poems over the last couple of years. Sonnet number 16. One in the array of all of yours and ours poems written off of Shakespeare's sonnets. There's a lot of them flowing around right now, so I'm throwing mine into, casting mine into the pool. Sonnet number 16. Love, you were so very much yourself, yet not only your own, but of something else to be taken away from home. Is it too weird to think and write against the coming end, as though to us impart resemblances for those selves we lend, so that your internal beauty, which you hold close, which you hold closed, a lease to unleashing, multiplying from yourself imposed, after you've gone, a book your imprint should bear. Who lets such thoughts and feelings collapse a hopeless affair? When nurture of those lost words fulfill their motion, a continuous structure in the coming storm's implosion of apocryphal winter's derangement, none wasted, and you must surely know their assuagement. You had fathers and mothers, let your own have their form. Sure, all words are orphans, and inextricably of others born. You can tell me after the reading if there's such word as assuagement. I guess there is now. <laughs> Hourglass for Veet. If hour after hour a heart is filled, what particles drop through the hallway, through the glass throat, sifted between the rocks, between our toes, under the waves at the plage at Nice, that wash of accumulated espresso grounds, that spray across the white wall of a cup, an alphabet from the depths of earth. Every morning flung as a horizon that rings the world. The smoky, dark taste of strangeness, everything that happens crowding your thoughts until one shaped like a tear emits from the dropper and tastes like cherry bark and your lover's fingers. You are an hourglass that reverses at the hour, diffused within the streaming that spreads out until it eludes its measure and becomes some other time, and you become some opposite you, briny, amber-locked, bitter, beekeeper honey. The dark stuff we bring up from the foam and ask again, how did you sleep? Did you have any dreams? Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louisa May Alcott. Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louisa May Alcott rode together in a black silk carriage until it became submerged gradually in a greenish swamp or large pond of moss rimmed with grandfather clocks. And from the embankment, I saw its clandestine outline, the skeleton of a ship, the frame of a parasol and bonnet, the fossils of a prehistoric bird with an enormous wingspan embedded in clay. I was crying for some reason, my tears, fossils also, but much smaller, more like trilobites, haphazardly sc scattered in mud, although there was an air of picnicking, too, of watching a movie at night, of being very awake and knowing you sleep in a graveyard of conveyances in which these two personages were felt to have been there and are nowhere present. When I jumped into the movie for Lorna Smedman, when I jumped into the movie, I left my shoes on the floor, 
something like Alice in Wonderland, but less lateral, more electronic and immersed, in the bulging white screen, or was it an inverse pool? The particles of a shadow on a blue willow plate, where within its perimeter, a woman guides an ox. A hand inside a sepia crocheted glove, who is eating this uneasy abstract food? Who fingers the refracted sheen of an invisible cloth? The air is made of polka dots, the bent hypnotus of the sun, in the semi-industrial area of a thought. In the mechanics of the frosted morning light, her golden fox stole and deep red lipstick, red as religion, archaic as smut, seems frescoed, hand-drawn. I wonder if this is my unknown grandmother, but whose grandmother is known anyway? In the collapsed linearity of a Kodak black and white, something smells like Vicks, moths, and hair. Are you far from home, someone asks? From the folds of elapsed space, the less visible the thing is. And the radiating light of a brain gives dimensionality and form to the fused hydrogens of a comb, a chair, a spoon. The way an ice cube locks in a negative throws itself off to the chamber of its unfolding. Midnight blue sweater. I guess it's the midnight blue sweater, heavy with its own knitted folds and sparkling buttons, that brings together the edges, a door with a diamond-like lock, and you say, this is the cloth I will move through and underneath, just to get to the other side. And in the morning, a shadow sleeps on a chair. Its singular sleeve, its invisible arm, a needle connected to its ambient torso, a long dangling umbilicus, milky shadow of thread, chains that forgive their previous silhouette and function. Here's a poem that's pretty much a, um, a transcription from the conversation of two cousins. Um, one of the persons being my son, Jackson Highfill. And uh, these boys did not know I was taking down their conversation. <laughs> and it's pretty much, as Joe Elliott reminded me, a classic boast poem, Minnow, from Jackson Highfill and Max Claypool. Then I came back to life in my stomach, then I pooped you out, skin and bones, baby. I woke up alive in your stomach, then you pooped me out. I fell down and died. I was a praying mantis, and you were a praying mantis. I was a ladybug, and you were an aphid, the end. Then I came back as a condor and ate you. Then I turned into an eagle and ate you. Then I turned into a crocodile and ate you. Then I became a shark and ate you. Frozen in ice, then haunted the sea but I was a storm and capsized your boat. What happened to the fishermen? They turned into just bones. Sharks don't float, they sink when they die. Well, this is a special one. You're a minnow, then the next thing you know, you're being smashed by a fisherman's boot. <laughs> Last poem. This vaunted world. Here in the tangle of this vaunted world, one already doubts. Not vaunted, but here, as we know or apprehend or suspect erratically the transience of the validity of a location which, just, which could just as much be a, blazing light, be a blazing hole of light in the overall gauzy mesh curtain of the realm that spins multidimensionally. As though the ceiling of Grand Central Station were a description of a fact, and one could transpire and is doing so every instant to transgress the constellations which stand gigantically in the air as raging constant events, encompassing our subsets, the brackets of an equation on a universal greenish curved page it will take your whole life to read. Thank you. Find your seats. Okay, we're going to get started now with the next reading, which is by Laura Moriarty. And I would like to just extend a personal thank you to Laura for coming here all the way from the Bay Area. We really appreciate that. It's great to have her here. It's a special, special opportunity for us to hear her read her poetry. 
Laura Moriarty was born in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1952, grew up on Cape Cod, and has lived in Northern California since 1966. She attended Sacramento State University and the University of California at Berkeley. She's taught at Naropa University and Mills College. She was the archives director for the Poetry Center and American Poetry Archives at San Francisco State University from 1986 to 1997. And she has been the deputy director of small press distribution in Berkeley since 2004. Laura Moriarty is the author of 11 books of poetry and two novels. Her books include Persia, Rondeau, L'Archiviste, Spicer's City, The Case, Cunning, a short novel, Nude Memoir, Self-Destruction, Ultravioletta, a novel, A Semblance, Selected in New Poems, 1975 to 2007, and her most recent book, A Tonalist, published by Night Boat Books in 2010. Laura Moriarty's poetry begins from speech, that is, her poem, Persia, begins from sound, poetry as music, as, quote, a woman much withered, a maid, a maiden with a wand, a handsome maid, white wand with a peacock of solid gold on its tip. But that poem continues in the vernacular, quote, who did you meet, quote, phrases subvert expectation gently as when she writes, quote, the blue crack as the snow unfastens the house. That we think we are hearing unfastens the blouse is confirmed some 20 lines later when Moriarty writes, quote, blouse crumpled my breasts unbuttoned into sleeping lips. From the poem, Waking from Sleep a Thousand Miles Thick. This kind of mental play is typical of the erotics Moriarty continually introduces. Quote, a trap is laid, or a tramp, she writes in the 10th card. Or, quote, one entire piercing me hard thoughts for once, for to me they're both him, from six histories. Moriarty varies her use of form, working in rondo, in projectivist spread forms, and in hybrid forms, combining poetry and prose. She's also a master of prose as poetry. Not the prose poem, which she can also write, but the novel poem, as in her book-length work, Ultra Violetta. Yes, it has a story, but the whole effort of it is poetic. The effect of wordplay and abstraction is, if anything, more intensely felt. Her writing is deeply invested in the most careful study of words, while simultaneously giving evidence to a particular woman's experience. It empowers all humans, instructing and delighting. In a recent poem, Transposition, she asks, is there a transposition when sound imitates music? As Duncan wrote, he loved Levertov in the letters that make love evolve as a consequence of telling. Laura Mariardi's music tells us what it is to be. Please welcome her to Dia. Thank you, Vincent, for that lovely introduction, and thanks for reading from all my <coughs> hot sex poems from my youth. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> Those were the days. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I, you probably got the, um, I moved to Northern California in 66 from a bio that I wrote, but I, uh, actually I think I moved in to Northern California in 65, and I, I say that just because it comes up in a poem um, that I'll read later. Uh, it's uh, thank you to Vincent for inviting me, and um, thank you to Dia and to Megan, who's been very sweet to me in our many emails. And um, thank you to New York for being warmer than California right now. <laughs> and um, I'm just really, really pleased to be here. And it's also a great delight to read with Kim Lyons because um, she's a wonderful poet, but also she's beloved. And so it's a great pleasure to read with her. 
Um, there were a number of commonalities that came up uh, that I noticed when she was reading the word divination, the word dowser, and the word ladybug. Um, how likely is that that uh, those three words would actually come up? Um, I, you can, might be able to tell that I have a cold, may pass out, um, <laughs> but uh, I think I'm kind of going on adrenaline here, and hopefully that will uh, see me through. I'm going to read the last section of um, Atonalist. Um, Atonalist um, is a kind of conceptual gesture in um, group formation in a sort of funny way. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot that I can say about it and I, there's an intro in it and you can read that, but um, at a certain point I just wanted to name a kind of writing that I was doing that I think of as lyric or anti-lyric because even though I would say that I write lyric, I don't really do the workshop poem or I don't write a little epiphany poem. I occasionally have epiphanies and they might come up in the poem, but you know, it, it, it's just a little different. It's more, it's just different. And, and there's a lot of us that do this and um, it tends to not be uh, thought of or focused on as much um, in some ways. And so I wanted to name it. And uh, first I named it tonalism, but then I, because I was interested in that old um, landscape uh, art form, and then I realized that tonalism was too linear. And so then a, a tonalism came up uh, with its many, um, uh, went many connections. And I didn't really use t ism either. I, I was wanting to be like the situationist and call it a tonalist. But you know, I mean, there's something kind of, like there aren't really atonalists. <laughs> Although I just told someone that he was an atonalist yesterday. Um, <laughs> but they, atonalists tend to not like to be in groups and so, and they don't like to be identified as being in a group. And so it's been very troubling trying to um, organize them. Um, and so this idea though, it comes up in this book, uh, which is about it, and then in the, I'll read from uh, a manuscript where it, I'm still kind of thinking about that and considering it. Long time no, you are home when you read this, a new element appears. Californium or ether either explodes or you are glad to see me. Barely audible or at times loud, complaints and admissions side by side with whatever else you've got. A small house in the woods, tiny sun, tiny moon, or nothing but fog and beyond that the world. And Stooges three, the summer dry climate we had when we had a climate before the war, the sea, the hills, the children, a beach book. I read backward to the source of the river mouth, thicket to ticket where you arrive to write, quote, with a taste for boundlessness and in a mood for annihilation, Bermuda Antigua, Standard Schaefer. Not you, and then yes, you, your version, since unwritten, vision, recomposition, as of relatives mine, hung for stealing bread, unsung, anti-heroic, island dwellers, not in your mind. In my heart, I read what you want to hide. I forget it. It forgets me. We get together in a party or a movement, moving heaven and earth until only earth is left or heaven. These are the last pages of the notebook. Your mind is mine, you say, not romantically, but as a category shift, or maybe this is a con. I give a tonalist talk. I start with the letter and work my way to the space between. Words, I am there now. I go back and forth until I get to the next letter. It is a correspondence. And then there is the sound of the song, a tonality embraced by the reader when the writer escapes, and vice versa, emptiness, space, whatever you want to call it, it is left to its own devices. Finally, a person appears, a reference or referent, client, patron, or customer. She is alive in the act of reading, actual size, fat chance, ample even. It, it, Again, I live in the work of my friends, she says, and I wonder if this means she feels most alive when she is reading. She says yes and no, mostly no, mentioning her husband, her lover, and her kid. I say me too, and we sit for a minute, picturing the friends, the husbands, etc. I feel implicated by the suggestion of there being a fourth stooge. See below, start over. These are almost poems. That we write it all is subject to doubt, doom, direct and then not. Nothing to be said but yes to it. 
Quote, don't watch the moon, do something. Imitation poems, Patrick Durgan. Quote, for him, each apposite sonority was etiological. My human, and later, quote, free of psychology at last untrue, here's my signature, it's legal, then signed. What a relief, there is agreement. It is personal, realistic, accurate, available, and untrue. Works for me, but for you, what will work? Where will you go when it's over? Where have you already gone? It's more like a TV series than a geography. You complain, you send another ticket, another picture of the bottom of the cell floor. Of your sea I sing, you say anthemically, and I say, I don't believe you, but don't I? Reason, as in resonate. Love, as in love eight. The take includes pictures. I celebrate the real. I see she begins again to sing of thee as if the past caught existing, works for me, she repeats, quote, the bright light of remainder remains, Melissa Buzeo, what began us and to what end? And when can I see you, beloved reader? Which is it? Someone says he is against the next war. Not me, you say, I won't go, have already not gone. It is not a war or a metaphor, but a convention, a convening. We look for it. It finds us cohering loosely, a fact or a faction. Is this a war or a police action? Is this that? Can't get no. You made me take that line out before, but here it is again, the world. Your next book, The War Over, Your Topia. Don't get me started. Quote, art or situations of partially suspended disbelief, of foregrounding, of heightening or intentional flattening, of protected description and inflated proposition is a locus in any society, at any scale, for strategic relations as a kind of model. Mike Scharf for Kid Rock, Total Freedom. So is this a novel or a prophecy? Idly fingering the trigger, what will I say when someone asks after you? What have I already said? The reading tonight, the dead, the undead. Children who are vampires, lovers who are Martians. Redefined, we march raggedly, the tune, in the wrong time, oneself not in one's right mind, by meaning overcome, by rights done, by nights undone. But someone wants your music. A reader stops by, asking the writer about the deal. The dealer replies by dealing. The next thing, you hear or not, present but unrequited, unseated, unsighted, collectively. Non is not a category but a pretext, collaborative in the worst sense, feeding off each other in a frenzy. Your teeth, my dark thoughts. The horizon, those in the bay are counted. Sharks, not poets. Together for a time, solitary hunters at the top of the food chain look down on us in our bright schools. Emergent sublunary, not the moon by definition, not a geography, but telemetric. Quote, we exist amid permanent damage to the replica, Estrin. Long an illusion, the world ends. The Northwest Passage stops not being. Hell not frozen though over, heaven cold. Quote, sing my astronaut suit, Estrin again. Snow sensitive skin, Brady and Halpern. Descending into recon by fire. Where shadows will for Norma again when full night but bright, scans wide, pans back. Often rarely we as now at table or together in our heads try not to hide we don't die until a long time later. We meet, I read your book, each new line. I get lost in the familiar words. It's win-win or lose-lose. This is the last contradiction. As if I had control over that, over these, aloud, now, here, there, you declare, not to be seen is to be dead. But I say, this death is in your head. It's my turn to pay in you that I already, and why not, have paid or we'll see a shadow where space left everything out. When the negative, a positive for another, taken literally for granted, yours or mine also not, you alive now, my love, and I know. So that's the end of A Tonalist. And um, then I'm gonna read from another <coughs> manuscript um, called Who That Divines, which will come out from Night Boat in 2014. And uh, Nightboat, Nightboat gave me a long uh, timing for, um, the, I sent it to them a while back and they said, well, you know, a couple years, which has been kind of good because I've been rewriting it. Um, and it is, um, 
in relation to, it, it, it was originally called divination. Um, that's another Kim um, mention. Um, and it's short poems, so it's not like, A Tonalist is a series of long poems that are connected with essay, whereas Who That Divines is, a, is really sections of short poems. And I kind of enjoyed writing these short poems, which everybody has so much bad to say about. Um, and its lyric are kind of anti-lyric. It, it, it examines um, atonality. It also, because the original title was Divination, it examines, it examines, and in a way, it's good that Vincent read from Persia because it's kind of a rewriting of Persia. Persia was a book up in, written in relation to Tarot poems. Um, and I didn't indicate that in the book because in the 80s, it's just not something you would have said. <laughs> but, um, it, but I've always had a kind of fascination for the divinatory arts. And um, there's a kind of playfulness to it. There's a whole Ladybug section. This is the other I now mentioned. And this book, Ladybug Laws, was um, put out by Slack Buddha Press. Anybody, it's a little bit wrinkled, and I'm not going to read from it, but anybody that asks me for it can have it. Um, and there's an herbal aspect, there are maps, and um, so it has a, a certain uh, quality. So you'll see from, hopefully from my reading it. Um, I'm gonna read the epigraphs um, because they've led me down a kind of strange road. Divinity is what we need to become free, autonomous, sovereign. This is Lucy Rigore from Sexes and Genealogies. It's translated by Gillian Gill. Poet be like God famously Jack Spicer from Imaginary Elegies. And my only salvation is happiness, the atonal happiness within the essential it. And that is Cl Clarice Lispector. And um, I also wanted to read just a few lines. I've, I started a kind of introduction which will give you a sense of what's going on here. The life and death struggle for recognition among gendered subjects is the background of ordinary life. It is so ordinary you forget about it. Ordinary relates to order, row, series, course, array. The situation or struggle is ordinary or almost, or, or blé, a natural luxury or joy because it's good to struggle or to be incomplete. It's good to organize. There is also the question of what is true, what is knowledge, what fate, faith, also ordinary. Atonalist rules for the game when we are afraid narrative coincides with meaning flatly in love with rhetorical continuity interrupted only be only to be taken back up like two things in one beauty for example the present and past enter into a prosody of unfinished gesture against formal predictability synopsis is predicament irony mitigated by shamelessness Lack of value for the conspicuous turning mentioned earlier of fate into history. Unable to be made, unfashionable as the fact of particularity when prediction becomes love of that chance. Of course, um, Schoenberg was associated with atonality and interestingly, he didn't like the word. Nobody likes the word. Everyone associated with it has an issue with the word. Um, and uh, he, he said uh, that it non-tonal would have been a better way to put it. Non-tonal after Schoenberg. Dreams a rule with words not mine, not a body, not belief, his lines, melancholic dusty waltzes, knowledge of techniques, technique of knowledge, imagination overcome, beautiful nightmare, opposed to genius, letters not addressed suggest new sound or new personality, death sick moon, while remaining virtually unperformed, arousing resistance, every innovation destroys what it produces. The bonds of a bygone aesthetic floated into the non-tonal. Speech becomes music with no other aim than comprehensibility. Blacks the sun. Textures rent by incompatible elements. Speech versus music. I feel the air from another planet. Not a technique, but a passing phase. Uncatalogued dissonance. Pierrot Lunaire, growing up with the same influences, emotional revolution, or a different place and time with the same mind, having, having abandoned tonality, we create language, not style, with an almost somnambulous sense, 
bravely to plunge, free composition and sublime banality, the green horizon, makes the past accessible to the new feeling, laughs, spits, hisses, makes animal cries, made of the sky, complains, if you do this, you are not free to do that. A new geological formation, serial universe, obvious musicality or universes, remix ensemble, not a single thing or will be. Notes on divination. I have a certain interest in um, Robinson Crusoe from My Secret Identity, identity as Mrs. Robinson. Um, because my husband's name is Nick Robinson. And I was originally named after the song, Laura, and, um, and then there's the other song, Mrs. Robinson, whatever comes on, I think, ah, oh, my song. Okay. <laughs> Notes on divination. When I came to my castle, Crusoe says, the indefinite overcomes certainty, Dao De Jing, flood editions, I Ching, Dao De Jing, impelled by the dual forces of academic opportunity and war, the Baroque Encyclopedia of Athanasium Kirshner, Delta Primer, R. Crusoe, Versions, Robinson in Space, Various Herbals, Emmanuel Hocard's Robinson Method in Crosscut Universe, Prospero's Books and the Falls, Malakoff, Malakoff, Archimedia Vulgaris, Mugwort. But how could I know from my place on the road, protected by emanating a dark aura, Semina, the Rocketeers, Racketeers, Spaceports, Martian Moon, Phobos, Powerful Solar Storms, Bright Orange Star, near the infinite, infinite Jovian Moons. Am I happy, he asks her. He said everything old is new again, but the life he imagined, yesterday, yesterday dramatic, today okay. Full knowledge, shocking passivity, later the line or map in the sand or of sand. The footprints figures except in Kotzia's foe, where the tongue becomes the body part, we notice its absence, meaning a limit like that of an island or the planet or the plan. If a rug is a garden, is a garden an island? An unnamed ship named Ariel in Buñuel's 1952 version, which begins with a shot of the book. Quote, it was a most striking, it was most striking to be surrounded by new birds, new reptiles, new shells, new plants, and yet by innumerable trifling details of structure, and even by the tones of voice and plumage of the birds, to have the temperate plains of Patagonia or the hot dry deserts of northern Chile vividly brought before my eyes. Charles Darwin, Journal of the Voyage of the Beagle. The connection of pirates to Robinson of yellow to the time of day. It is late, for example, or very early in 1965, February 4th, and Robert Duncan is awake, writing, and I am 100 miles away, asleep, and 13. He is 46. My fate is to live where he lived later and to be here, all times at the same time. I, Robinson, cower in fear. And then this piece was commissioned by Vincent, actually. I think you gave me the song. Um, this was the, uh, the John Lennon uh, commissions. Stay with me, after John Lennon, half of all I say you know equals action or ocean calls me not saying what he left leaving his life, but his wife stays with him in her mind as you with me in mine. This is, this is the poem where the word dowser comes up. The modern dowser. Of wand or rod we sing when dowsers convene, south red, southwest green, free capillary action, thin layer coats, we who show, north violet, northeast blue, pellicular advantage as porous, behavior of water learnt then, deep sand otherwise choked, vital, fecund, victorious, without faith or face, but with ring at the end of a string, clockwise for a hen, opposite for a cock, a diagnostic weapon we speak of, the restoration of Pluto, but mean love. The weak motion in physical memory called fading between divinatory magnetism and electrical lies, independence of vision, muscular events, a question of time or tone, east green, southeast yellow, a Valentine, several Germans, a Texan, and Michael Palmer, who gave me the modern dowser, whose anniversarial foundations of castles and alleys buried gold, stomping and counting, heterodyne interference operations, and numerous errors in the application, 
west black, northwest white, or the simple rule, modicum equals win, pendulum stays, results obtain when waves drawn out, forecast today's ground into water, the same rain. <clears throat> Psychogeography. I'll be ending with a kind of elegy. It's another, it's a couple of series of elegies. It's another aspect of uh, a tonalist is a kind of obsession with elegy. Psychogeography. The place protects its own, giving into you only if you find and give into it in turn and unfold the map of the trail to the past beyond which you wish to go, or have gone, though you can't, as you know, go when the feeling comes up from the ground yet again, and you give in, while the idea of place replaces your face with its earthy smile. Quiet morning for Leslie Scalapino. A bowl of gardenias by the Kuan Yin, though magnolia was her flower, but here on my steps, or there in her house where, in ordinary life, last but once, I saw her alive. We had tea and sweets, stuffed with bean paste, years gone by, following pleasure, wherever it worked. We had tea again, and she by then only angel food, and determination would live still, but wildly, if she could. A frank sonic for Jerry Estrin. Snow covers the hills one by one, our neighborhood characters become San Francisco, 1874, words, later language, a photograph at home when Light writes 1974 as the lives of my books, or 1989, me move where pages accumulate, not legible as themselves. Historical time, startled, leaves us, unafraid though overgrown, died in 1993, moved in 1994 in pink stone earlier in the park, wrote shells and cherubs, the cathedral, the fountain. And then I'm going to close with um, this piece called Palm Sunday. And uh, it was written in relation to a reading group run by David Brazil. Um, Palm Sunday's bread of the presence, or a sword appears, meaning war, or at least danger, yields nothing and falls away as we stumble among weeds growing together as ourselves, having eaten it, the bread and being present, but hidden in a narrative, demonstrates the field is the world, unbelief and distrust and things misbegotten. All of it existed and occurred. The crowd was there, represented by Salome, asked for and got the head, without doubt and strong winds out on the sea, came as an offering or human precept, walking on water, this is later, merely saying, listen and understand. How do you not get it? But don't tell anyone. Who doesn't set his mind on the divine thing called transfiguration or substantiation, as in God talking away the day and God's wife corroborating his story, or girlfriend rather, saying about no sin, and I don't, so you might not want to judge me before judgment comes, the unknown night, time in the garden, time on the hill of skulls, time to remember the debris of a life with the rust and dust we never got rid of because that part of the story wasn't true. And everything at once is one way of looking at what happens and is also the other way, breaking down into constitutive elements like it's almost May and the camellias are out and the old cherry tree by the driveway is not quite dead after all. Thank you.